Hi friends and welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Crime Corner with Jen and for those of you who don't know, my name is Jen and I talk about true crime cases on this channel. Before we jump into today's case and if you like my contents, please be sure to like, subscribe, and to turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any of my future videos. In this week's video, we're going to be continuing on with the Taylor Parker case. So this is part two. And if you haven't watched last week's video, I highly recommend it because everything will be so much easier to understand once you have the context from part one. Just to recap for everybody, Taylor Parker was arrested and charged for the murder of Reagan Hancock and her unborn child in October 2020. Taylor had committed this horrible crime at Reagan's home in front of her three-year-old daughter and then had fled the home with Reagan's baby, who she had just removed from Reagan's body. Taylor would then be pulled over by a state trooper for reckless driving on the US-82 while she was trying to get to a hospital in Itabel, Oklahoma. And when the state trooper approached her vehicle, Taylor would tell him that she had just given birth on the road while driving and she was in need of immediate medical assistance. Now, one of the most shocking things about this crime is that Taylor had lied to her baby daddy, to her family, to her friends, doctors, just basically everybody about being pregnant. And at the time of the crime, Taylor was desperate. She was in full panic mode, she was overdue with her baby, and she was running out of time. People were finally beginning to suspect that maybe she wasn't pregnant. So to try to save herself and try to save face, she decides to commit one of the most barbaric crimes I've ever researched. Taylor Parker didn't just commit murder. She orchestrated financial scams, a hospital bomb threat, a house fire, and an entire fake pregnancy. And she managed to keep this lie going for almost an entire year and bamboozled dozens of people. And again, if you haven't watched part one of this case, please be sure to do so. The video was uploaded last week and we do go through all the details of the financial scams and all the other scams and schemes, as well as the entire fake pregnancy timeline. For this second video, we're going to be talking about the aftermath of Taylor's arrest. So that includes witness testimonies as well as shocking details that were released during her sentencing period. You'd think that after everything Taylor's done, she would feel some sort of remorse or regret. But the details I'm about to share with you guys today in this video prove that Taylor had absolutely zero regrets or remorse for anything that she did, even after being arrested and during her time in jail. Taylor would be arrested on October 9th, 2020 and held in the Bowie County Jail with a bond set at $5 million. This bond was never reduced and Taylor would remain in custody until her sentencing start date of October 12th, 2022. During the sentencing period, the jury would hear from over 142 witnesses over a course of 25 days. But before we dive into the different testimonies from all the different witnesses, let's talk a little bit about what Taylor was up to during her time in jail. So, you'd think that after being arrested, Taylor would decide to be smart and would put a stop to all of her scheming, considering it was her scheming that landed her in jail in the first place. She continued running different schemes while in jail, and there have even been reports of her attempting to frame other inmates. One of the very first schemes that Taylor begins running while in prison is actually one that she works very closely with her mother on. According to supplemental documents released to the public on October 11th, 2022, Taylor and Shauna were running this financial scheme in prison to avoid Taylor having to pay the prison or the government back what she owed in medical fees. Taylor had apparently racked up over $2,000 in medical bills and was refusing to pay it. And because she refused to pay off her medical bill, anytime money was deposited into her commissary account, the jail would immediately take that balance and then use it to pay off her medical debts. So to get around this, Taylor would have her mother deposit money into other inmates' accounts and then she would have them go and purchase items on Taylor's behalf. 
Taylor would then give the other inmates a cut of her scheme by allowing them to take whatever item that they wanted from her purchases. And you're probably wondering, how did the authorities find out about this? The two weren't exactly discreet in their communications about it. They spoke extensively about their plans on the phone, through the mail, as well as through emails sent back and forth between them in the jail kiosks. Also, if you've watched part one of this case, you'll know that Taylor had come up with all these horrible lies about Shauna, her own mother. So I'm really surprised that Shauna's even helping Taylor with this because did she forget all of the stories she spun about Shauna? She literally told people that Shauna was out to get her, that Shauna was controlling and evil and she was a monster, and that Shauna had even tried to get her killed. Another thing that was also discussed in the documents was that Taylor was repeatedly ripping up her own clothes. Why? Because apparently she wanted to look more revealing and attractive to the other inmates and to the guards. And after ripping up her clothes, she would phone her parents and she would tell both of her parents, who are divorced by the way, so she would go to her dad first and then after that she would go to her mother and ask for the same thing. She would call them separately and she would tell them, oh my gosh, you know, the conditions in here are so bad, I'm so cold and my clothes are just, they're, they're falling apart in here because of the terrible conditions in the jail. And she would ask them, like, can you please send me more money so I can buy new and warmer clothes? And her parents, being the enablers that they are, didn't even question this. Not even when it started happening regularly and the excuses that she was giving them couldn't have made sense. Other inmates who knew Taylor during her time in jail have testified that Taylor had done this intentionally. She would poke holes and rip her clothes in order to make herself look more provocative. She would flirt with the inmates and even with guards and would begin developing relationships in jail. One inmate that Taylor had developed an intimate relationship with while in prison and who would later on testify against Taylor during her sentencing period was a woman by the name of Lana Addison. Lana stated that when she first met Taylor, she had absolutely no idea what Taylor was in jail for. And when Taylor told her about why she was in jail, her chain of events would be far from the truth. Taylor would tell Lana that she was in jail for murder but she didn't actually commit this murder. She had, in fact, been framed by a group of gang members. The exact details of how it all went down seemed to change every time Taylor would tell this story to Lana. But in short, Taylor said that while driving one day, she saw flashing lights coming from a vehicle, and so she stopped her own vehicle, got out, and went over to the car to see if everything was okay. And this is apparently when Taylor was drugged and then, for whatever reason, was driven to Reagan's home. And when she came to, she realized that Reagan was being attacked by a group of gang members. The very same group of gang members who had drugged her and then had driven her to Reagan's house. Eventually, the gang members left and when she ran over to help Reagan, Reagan would look at her and plead for her to save her baby. And Taylor claimed that she had done what Reagan had asked her to do, which was to save the baby by removing the baby from her belly. Taylor then claims that after removing Reagan's baby from her, she would put the baby up to Reagan's face, and then she would start crying and saying over and over again, we did it, we did it. And that is when Reagan apparently gives her one last smile and takes one final breath before passing away. It's straight out of a movie, honestly. Anyways, for whatever reason, Lana decides to believe Taylor, and the two would continue getting closer and closer. But eventually, Taylor would tell Lana that she was sick and tired of feeling lonely, and that she didn't really like being surrounded by women all the time. She was sick of it. She missed dating men. So she would tell Lana that she wanted to end things with her, and then right after, she would begin developing relationships with other male inmates from other facilities. Taylor was apparently speaking with a number of inmates from different facilities, all male, and she had a number of relationships going on at the same time. Now, what's wild here is that she would use her family to get in touch with all these inmates. So she would use them 
as a middleman for all of the communications that she would have with all of her different boyfriends. Taylor had been seeing a man named Travis Blocker. Well, not seeing. She was communicating with a man named Travis Blocker. He was an inmate from a different facility, and he was being moved. And because of this move, Taylor would have her mother go and look up Travis through some websites and basically track him down, then tell him that if he wants to get in touch with her, he should do it through Shauna or through Taylor's dad, Mark. And of course, her parents would oblige and they would do this for her not just with Travis, but with a number of other inmates. On September 12th, 2021, Taylor would send an email to an inmate that she had become close to, a woman by the name of Christina Morell. In her email, she would write, I need a sugar daddy to load me some money on this thing. LMAO. Anything on Blocker, aka Travis? Oh, is Brad Obanowski's from Sims. Text him to add me so I can talk to him. Or message him for me on Facebook, please. I miss you bunches. I'm lonely. I hate this. The following day, she would email Christina again, and that email would read, Have you Facebook Travis Blocker yet? Will you do that this week for me, please? Also text Brad Obanowski. Tell him to add me on jailatm.com or Facebook. I need some men to talk to. I wrote that one you told me, the pen pal. It's boring as hell and lonely. This woman is in jail for murdering a- another woman and her unborn child. And instead of spending this time to reflect and to prepare for her upcoming trial, She's literally just spending all of her time whining about being lonely and trying to talk to men and running schemes. I'm really not sensing any kernel of remorse from this woman. Like zero, absolutely zero. I don't even feel like she's thinking about what she's done whatsoever. And according to different reports, whenever other inmates would ask her, why are you in jail? She would tell them, oh, I can't go into the details, but trust me, I'm 100% innocent. I absolutely didn't do what they're saying I did. In December of 2021, Taylor would begin communicating with another male inmate from a different facility by the name of Alan Polly. When asked why she was in jail, she would give him the following statements. Unfortunately, I can't talk details information-wise since I'm in pre-trial. I don't go to trial until September 2022. I'm innocent. Assuming you have been to jail before, you know how unjust our BS system is. It does suck, but I have a great team. I have become very close with him and have all the faith that it will work out. I do freelance recruiting for manufacturing industrial plants in the killed trade departments on top of breeding and selling cattle. You can say I'm a farm girl. Please don't think I want anything from you, a very independent, respectful person. First of all, the justice system obviously sometimes sucks, for sure. But in her case... To say, oh, how unjust, how unfair it is that I'm in prison. You murdered somebody. You murdered two people, actually. You murdered a woman and her unborn child. And you're sitting there complaining about how unfair it is that you're in prison. The audacity, guys. The absolute audacity of this woman. And just a month prior, so sometime in November 2021, Taylor would become romantically involved with another inmate by the name of Augustine Diaz. Taylor and Augustine's communications were very, very inappropriate and just not YouTube friendly, so I won't go into the details of what they were discussing. But while talking with Augustine, Taylor would continue on with her lies. She would tell him that her ex, but she didn't specify which ex, she just said an ex, would constantly fat shame her and would tell her that she was disgusting and would call her all sorts of names. She would even go so far as to tell him that if she had even gained an ounce, then her ex would hurt her. And then she would also tell Augustine that if he didn't like women with big thighs, then this relationship wasn't going to work out. Again, she didn't specify which ex she's talking about, but considering her history, I highly doubt that any of that information is true. And this woman, who happens to be the queen of lies, also tells Augustine the following. Please, I have said this before. I'm so understanding. Just don't lie to me. 
I'd love to build a home and family with you based on God. That's a dream and hope I will hold on to and pray. I would never play someone's emotions. Games are not for me. I will voice that loud and clear. I want to plan for the future. I'm honestly just curious to know whether or not she had any actual feelings for these men or if she was just bored and looking for someone to keep her busy. It's just a little bit shocking to me, like all of these relationships that she's building because I really thought that she was fully in love with Wade. I mean, she went to great lengths to keep Wade in her life. But ever since she went to prison, it kind of seems like she's forgotten about him. I also find it really interesting that she didn't think things through while in prison, while communicating with all these different people. Because she's basically left a paper trail of evidence in her communications with these boyfriends and her inmates, and with her family as well. So did she not think that the court or the prosecutors would eventually gather up all this evidence and use it against her in court to show that she was a liar and a manipulator? She really should have thought that through. Because all of this, everything that she's communicated and everything that's in these documents were presented to the jury and to the court. They were presented to everybody to show that she is a psychopath, she is a liar, she's manipulative. All of this was used as evidence. And I'm just shocked that she's never once thought about it, about the fact that it could be used against her. At one point during her communications with Augustine, she even tells him, I love to read, but my true joy is writing. I love every part of putting together a story. And for once, that's not a lie. She loves coming up with all these crazy stories and fantasies and using that to mess with people's minds. I also very much believe that Taylor tends to do things only if he'll play in her favor. Doesn't seem like she just does things for the sake of doing things. Take all of her relationships, for example, both platonic and romantic. All of them seem to serve some sort of purpose. Another relationship that I want to talk about is Taylor's relationship with a woman named Hannah Hollander. Hannah was a fellow inmate of Taylor's and was described to be mentally fragile. And Taylor, being the calculating person that she is, decided to target Hannah and to prey on her due to her fragile state of mind. She would befriend the woman, but only did so because she had plans to frame Hannah for the crime that she had committed. Do you guys remember how Taylor had told Lana that she had been drugged and then framed by a group of gang members? Taylor also tells Lana that their fellow inmate Hannah was also a part of that gang and had been there at the scene of the crime the day that everything took place. She also tells Lana that Hannah has already confessed to committing the crime. And she also tells Lana that the only reason she knows that Hannah was involved is because when she heard Hannah's voice in the jail, it rejogged her memories and she suddenly remembered that she heard Hannah's voice on that day when the gang was there attacking Reagan. And at the time, Lana does believe Taylor wholeheartedly because as we learn from many people, Taylor is a very convincing liar. And as I mentioned in my last video, it's almost crazier for someone to think that someone could make the, all of this up than it is to actually just believe that they're telling the truth. However, Lana would later discover the truth. Hannah had absolutely nothing to do with the murders. And honestly, she didn't even know Taylor before Taylor had arrived at this jail. Taylor had made up this whole entire elaborate lie just so that she could pin everything that she did on poor Hannah. It also turns out that in January of 2021, Taylor somehow convinced Hannah to give the officers in the jail a envelope of letters. She also convinced Hannah to tell them that she had written these letters and that the letters contained important information about the crime. But when the authorities would take Hannah in for interrogation and they would ask her about the specific details that she had written in the letter, they knew immediately that something wasn't right. What was written in the letter, the information, the chain of events, it just didn't make sense. It didn't add up. And when they asked Hannah about it, she really couldn't give them much of an answer because she didn't write it. 
she wasn't there. She had no idea about this actual crime. So, of course, she wasn't able to answer their questions or to make sense of things. The authorities would keep pushing and pushing Hannah for answers because they obviously know that someone's put her up to this and they want to get to the bottom of it. So they push her and push her and eventually she says, okay, I'll tell you the truth. Taylor had apparently told Hannah to tell the officers and to tell anybody who would listen to her that she had seen a black man driving in a vehicle, driving around the jail, making drop drops. And then she tells Hannah that Hannah must tell the officers that she saw the same exact man and the same exact vehicle in front of Reagan's home on October 9th, 2020. And Hannah, for whatever reason, agrees to this because she's somehow been convinced that she was there on the day of the crime and that she's the one who committed the crime and not Taylor. To be fair, I think it wasn't that difficult to convince Hannah of all of this just because of how fragile her state of mind was. And Taylor knew that and Taylor used that to her advantage. Taylor then later tells the officers that on a second thought, she doesn't actually think she's responsible for the crime because Taylor had actually already told her what happened that day. Taylor had allegedly told Hannah that she had gone over to Reagan's house on the day of the murders and that the two women had gotten into this huge fight. Reagan had discovered that Taylor wasn't actually pregnant and that she was past her due date. And somehow Taylor had convinced Reagan to help her call Wade and to tell Wade that she had lost the babies because Taylor didn't want to tell Wade that she had lied about being pregnant. Taylor said to Hannah that Reagan had initially agreed, but then Reagan had apparently had a change of heart and had backed out of the plan. And this is when Taylor would lose it and would do what she did. Taylor then tells Hannah that yes, she did remove the baby from Reagan's body, but she made sure to stay and wait until Reagan had fully passed before leaving the home with the baby. She also says that while Reagan's three-year-old daughter was there, Taylor had made sure that the daughter had stayed in her bedroom while all of this was happening so that she could avoid seeing her mother in that state. Taylor would confide in Hannah and tell her that things just didn't go to plan that day. Because as we all know, authorities did discover that Taylor was not the mother of the child. While Taylor was planning and scheming and attempting to pin this crime on Hannah, she would also, at the same time, begin focusing her schemes on another inmate, a woman by the name of Shauna Ray Yeager, otherwise known as Shauna. Shauna would also testify in court against Taylor, and she shares a lot of very interesting information about the scheme that Taylor had tried to run on her. It turns out that Taylor had befriended Shauna because she was hoping that Shauna would help her pin the crime on Hannah. You see, Shauna was about to be released from jail, and Taylor wanted Shauna to distribute a 14-page confession letter to the local newspaper, as well as to the Bowie County Sheriff and to Taylor's defense attorney, Jeff Harrelson. When I first read about this, I actually thought that this letter was going to be Taylor's confession letter. It turns out that Taylor had fabricated a 14-page confession letter and had written it from the perspective of the alleged perpetrator. Taylor had put the letters in an envelope, which she would give to Shauna. And when she was giving them to Shauna, she would tell Shauna, I don't know what's in the letters. However, I just want to say that this, it just doesn't sound believable. When she gave the letters to Shauna, she told Shauna that the letters contained key information about her crime. So if she didn't read the letters, then how would she know what was included? Like, how would she know that the letters included information about the crime? On top of that, Taylor then offers Shauna 5,000 US dollars to do what she's asking her to do. And mind you, this woman has a $2,000 medical debt that she's refusing to pay. So I don't know how she was planning to pay Shauna this $5,000 that she was promising her. And along with the envelope that she had given Shauna, Taylor would also include a note saying, Shauna, remember, make copies and destroy the original. Just make sure a copy gets to Jeff Harrelson. If it helps me, put them in manila envelopes. Let me just clarify something here. Taylor had wanted Shauna not to just hand these documents over, but she wanted Shauna to rewrite 
all of the letters in her own handwriting and then to find manila envelopes to make it look official before giving it to the local newspaper and the sheriff's office and her defense attorney. But it doesn't stop there, guys. It doesn't stop there. Taylor also tells Shauna that she needs to give these letters to another inmate named Sylvia Plunkett. And the instructions for Sylvia were to also open the letters, read them, and then to rewrite them in her own handwriting. She had reportedly offered Sylvia $15,000 to do this. Again, I don't know where these inmates think that Taylor's getting all this money from. This woman was using other people's accounts to get commissary items because she didn't want to pay $2,000 in medical debt. So I don't know where they thought that she was going to somehow get all this money to pay them what she promised. Luckily, instead of doing Taylor's bidding, Shauna would contact the authorities. When alerting the authorities, Shauna would also include a note to them saying, I feel Taylor will try and claim insanity, but to me this showed the level of manipulation she is willing to go through. She is constantly trying to put trustees into her schemes. Shauna, thank God, thank the Lord, she realized that Taylor was running some sort of scheme and that she couldn't be trusted. Something was just really off about Taylor's story and she just couldn't be trusted. Taylor had told Shauna that the letter that she had received was actually smuggled into the jail by a detective from the outside who was trying to help prove her innocence. But Taylor didn't think her plan through because when she gave the envelope to Shauna, Shauna knew right away that the envelope that, she, that Taylor had given her was an envelope that the prison gives out to inmates for free. So if this was smuggled in from a detective from the outside, why was it in one of the jail's free like envelopes for inmates? It just didn't make sense. Another thing that made Shauna incredibly suspicious was the fact that the letters were written in a familiar handwriting. The handwriting of the letters belonged to a woman, an inmate, named Phyllis Dawson. And Shauna knew this because Phyllis had helped Shauna fill out some forms earlier on, and she recognized Phyllis's handwriting. Now, Shauna testifies that once Taylor found out that she hadn't done what Taylor had told her to do, things got very interesting. Taylor would go on a campaign to slander Shauna's name and reputation in the jail. She would also tell people that Shauna had attempted to get her killed. So, needless to say, their friendship was very short-lived. According to Shauna's testimony, the letter that Taylor had given her did in fact include specific details about what might have happened on that fateful day. Shauna would recall from the letter, she was asleep in a back bedroom and some sort of altercation went on in the front. And when she came out, something had happened with some people and Reagan had been attacked. She had been beaten and hurt and Reagan had asked her to save the baby. Shauna also then recounts that Taylor had gone into the kitchen to get a kitchen knife to try to remove the baby from Reagan's body per Reagan's request. But when the kitchen knife didn't work, Taylor remembers that she has a knife that she uses on hogs stashed away in her car. So she goes to the car, she goes to retrieve it, she comes back, uses it, and she successfully removes the baby from Reagan. Shauna would then tell the jury that Taylor had put the baby up to Reagan's face and had said to Reagan, or to the baby, tell mama bye. Shauna then also says that she's not really sure what to believe, to be honest, because Taylor's given so many people so many different versions of what's happened. And it's honestly become so hard to figure out what's the truth and what isn't. At one point in their friendship, Taylor had even told Shauna that she had nothing to do with the crime and that she was 100% innocent, but that she did fake a pregnancy. When confessing to the fake pregnancy, she would also tell Shauna that she had also planned a fake miscarriage and that when the fake miscarriage played out, she would have somebody call Wade and tell him what had happened. So here we do have Taylor telling different people different versions of her story, but we also do start to see similarities emerging from those different stories. So it really does make me wonder if those similarities are actually 
the truth coming out in her different versions of stories. Now, you're probably maybe wondering how Taylor managed to get so many people to believe her and how she managed to get so many people to help her in her schemes. Taylor was very generous with her commissary purchases and on top of that, she was going around telling people that her family was super, super wealthy. She was spinning that story again of her being an heiress and that she was going to inherit millions of dollars. So Taylor would tell the other inmates that if they were willing to help her with the handwritten confessions and they were willing to testify that they had seen her elsewhere on the day of the crime, then she would help them out with their legal fees. And this somehow worked. Now, I want to quickly jump back to Philip Dawson. Taylor had apparently offered Phyllis Dawson $5,000 if Phyllis could find her witnesses to testify that they had seen Taylor elsewhere on the day of the crime. She had given Phyllis a puzzle book filled with instructions on this. According to the notes that were presented during the trial during Phyllis's testimony, Taylor wanted to find four people of color. And yes, she did specify this in her instructions. And she wanted those four witnesses to state that they had been driving home on the morning of the 9th after spending a night at one of their friends. While driving down Highway 8, they would see a flashing light and would pull up next to a black Toyota and a silver car to see if everything was all right. She then specified that she wanted the witnesses to state that they saw Taylor with two other people and that Taylor was passed out when they pulled up. She also wanted the witnesses to state that the other two people with Taylor had said that they had been out drinking and partying all night, so that's why she passed out. In short, she wanted people to testify in court saying that they did see Taylor, but very far, far away from Reagan's home. And the notes that were hidden away in the puzzle book for Phyllis, they were all presented during the trial because again, Taylor had this habit of leaving a paper trail, and Phyllis did hand over the book and all of the notes to the authorities. Now, here's what's interesting. Taylor tells Phyllis that she only wanted witnesses from the Black community. She wanted it this way because she believed that it would look amazing to everyone if four people from the Black community came forward because they wanted to help out a white female. Before we move on from Taylor's jailhouse schemes and relationships, I want to just share one more detail with you guys. Do you guys remember Lana, one of Taylor's first female lovers in jail? Well, during Lana's testimony, she would state that Taylor had confided in her about the fake pregnancy and that Taylor had confirmed that Wade knew nothing about it. Taylor had tricked Wade by ordering a fake baby belly. And then during the time that she was wearing the fake baby belly, she would tell Wade that the doctors had recommended that there would be no intimacy because intimacy during pregnancy was a huge risk. So basically, they didn't do anything together at all for months. And that's how she managed to hide the fact that she wasn't really pregnant. So that kind of explains to me now why Wade didn't know about the fake belly and explains why he had no idea about any of this. Alongside the money schemes, jailhouse relationships, and trying to frame other people for her crimes, Taylor would also claim that she was struggling with a number of mental and physical medical issues. She was already claiming all of this way before her arrest. However, when she got to jail, she really amped it up. On countless occasions, Taylor would pretend that she was ill so that she could be taken to the nurse's office. And while walking to the nurse's office, she would slip little notes to her inmate friends and to her boyfriends. She was doing this so regularly that the medical staff and the jail staff soon quickly realized that there was actually nothing wrong with her medically. Again, she was using this opportunity to pass notes around so that she could run her little schemes. And according to the staff in the jailhouse, if they ever took her to the nurse's office at a time that wasn't convenient for her, she would refuse to go and then would throw a fit. And because of her erratic and just rude behavior, the staff eventually just decided that they didn't want to put up with this anymore. 
So instead of taking her to the nurse's office every time she claims that she wasn't feeling well, they would just have the nurse and the medical team visit her in her cell and do the examinations there. And as you can imagine, Taylor was really not happy with this. Now, about a week after her arrest, Taylor would be taken in for a mental health crisis assessment. But going in, she would tell the crisis worker that she hadn't been sleeping well and that she had lost 20 pounds since her arrest. And she would also tell the crisis worker that she was experiencing random blackouts. And just two weeks later, at the end of October, Taylor would convince the jail staff to take her to the hospital. She somehow managed to convince them that she was so, so ill that she needed to be taken to the emergency service room. So the staff would take her to the ER, and when they arrived, she would tell the doctors that she had a history of strokes and that she suffers from factor V Leiden disorder. Now, this is a disorder that leads to blood clots and is one that you can only get from your parents. Taylor claims to have been diagnosed with this years ago, but when medical staff look into her medical history, they find no evidence of it. They would even run multiple tests looking for this disorder, but again, never found anything. After several days of back and forth on this fake disorder, Taylor would come to realize that her current plan wasn't working and that she would need to move to her next one. Taylor would begin telling the hospital staff that she was suffering from terrible headaches and that she just couldn't stop vomiting. Taylor would even tell them that she was having difficulties walking steadily. And of course, the doctors would take a look into this issue. And again, they found that there was nothing medically or physically wrong with her. In fact, Taylor was able to walk just fine. This turned out to be another failed plan and Taylor would be sent back to herself, much to her disappointment. My theory here is that Taylor likely wanted to spend as much time as possible in the hospital instead of in her cell, just because the hospital was a little bit less strict and a little bit less cramped than her cell probably was. So she was just looking for comfort and was running this little scheme to try to get around the system. Throughout her time in jail, Taylor would come up with a number of diseases and disorders that she would use to try to get special treatment from the guards and from her inmates. In March of 2021, she would tell Lana that she had been diagnosed with congestive heart failure, which of course was untrue. She would also tell people that she had a history of seizures and that her doctors recommended that she sleep in a completely dark room at night in order to avoid triggering any fits. But when the jail staff looked into her medical records, there was no trace of this either. She then went on to claim that she was experiencing blood clots, UTIs, chest pains, and the list just goes on and on and on. Taylor was also reportedly super mean to some of the jailhouse staff as well as the medical staff. And if they had all inconvenienced her in any way, she would just go into a fit. She would start yelling at them, calling them horrible names, making racial remarks, threatening them, and even going as far as to spread lies about some of the guards. She would literally come up with these fake stories about some of the guards, spread them to the inmates and even to other guards, trying to turn people against each other. She was a complete nightmare to the staff. Now, while in custody, Taylor did receive regular counseling, and this is a service that is provided to all inmates. And during one of her sessions in August 2021, she would confide to her counselor that she was praying for Reagan's family to truly know who she was and that she would never be capable of such a horrible crime. She even tells the counselor that she's considering a plea deal at this point because she thinks it might be best for everybody and then starts going on a whole rant about how she hates the person who committed this crime. It's so delusional. I do actually wonder if she actually believes that she's not guilty. Like, I, I wonder if there's something mentally wrong with this woman that's making her believe that she didn't actually do what she did. Because I feel like she believes most of her lies. I just don't understand. Like, how can you be this delusional? Again, the lengths that this woman will go to just to not have to take responsibility for what she's done just blows my mind. 
At this point, she's fabricated so many fake stories, disorders, and characters that it's getting really hard to keep up with all of her lies, even for her. And this becomes evidence for Taylor's counselor in April 2022. In April, Taylor would tell her counselor that she was beginning to hear voices in her head. The voices were becoming so persistent that she would often end up arguing with them throughout the day. And then in May of 2022, she would tell the counselor that actually this is not the first time she's heard voices in her head. In fact, she's been medicated for this since she was 11 years old. But this doesn't add up because in March to July of 2021, she tells the counselor that she has never been diagnosed or medicated for any mental illnesses. And of course, the counselor does take note of this lie and this discrepancy and does bring it up in her testimony. Taylor was honestly obsessed with being the center of attention. She loves to make up bizarre stories to stir the pot because this is what ensures that she gets to remain in the spotlight. And in addition to her love for being in the spotlight, Taylor was becoming more and more obsessed with murder. Taylor had had her mother send her books, tons of books, and all of these books were books about murder. She was also reportedly writing short stories about murders, and whenever she saw her inmate friends, she would discuss murders and crime with them. And at one point, she would even write a letter to the FBI telling them that she wanted to assist them in solving murders. And according to supplemental documents, Taylor had even told a correctional officer that she was going to be writing a book about the murder. She even went around claiming that Netflix and other television programs had approached her to ask if they could make a movie about her story. But of course, this would never happen because it wasn't true. And Taylor would tell people that the deal had fallen through because the Bowie County Jail didn't allow it. Taylor would also go around telling inmates and correctional officers that Reagan and her were best friends. She also tells people that she's absolutely heartbroken that Reagan's gone, she misses her every single day, and that she's also heartbroken that people could think that she would be capable of doing such a horrible thing to her best friends. Again, all lies. The two women barely knew each other. What's really disturbing to me is that when the pre-trial hearings began, Taylor began intentionally taunting Reagan's family. Reagan's favorite flower was the sunflower. And because of this, during the trials, the pre-trial hearings, her family would wear sunflower jewelry or clothing or just something that symbolizes the memory of Reagan through a sunflower. And in the pre-trial hearings, Taylor would start appearing in those hearings with a mask that had a sunflower on it. And she would wear this mask the entire time despite no one else wearing a mask, knowing what the symbol meant to Reagan's family. Now, let's talk about the actual sentencing period, which began on October 12th, 2022 and ran for 25 days. So much information was released during the sentencing period after 142 witnesses were called to the stand to provide their statements and after more information and evidence was presented. And I want to go over some of those statements and some of that information with you guys here. Taylor's sentencing kicked off with the prosecutors making the statement that Taylor is a liar and a con artist. Two very accurate descriptions. Followed by the statement that she was in it for the fame. Taylor was obsessed with fame. And she had reportedly, on countless occasions, asked the guards if she could stay up late just so that she could watch television and see herself on the news. However, Taylor's attorney would counter this by saying that they were going to be providing everyone with a full and accurate picture of Taylor and who she really was. They would start by saying that Taylor was a fantastic mom, but that she struggled with a few mental health issues. But if you've watched my first video, you know that this is not true. She was the worst mom ever. And we're gonna talk about some of that further on in this video. So over the next few weeks after October 12th, 2022, the court would begin calling witnesses to the stand to make their statements and to explain their connections to Taylor. 
One witness was Taylor's stepmother, Charlotte. Charlotte would describe Taylor to be a very good girl while growing up, but admitted that Taylor had a very creative imagination. She also admitted that Taylor had a lot of difficulties with accepting responsibility for things she did wrong. She would also admit that Taylor would often lie in order to get what she wanted. After Charlotte's statement, Taylor's ex-husband's divorce attorney would take the stand to provide his statement. The ex-husband that we're talking about is Tommy Wakasi, and Tommy and Taylor do have a son together. Also, I do want to clarify that Taylor also has a daughter, but that was with a man named Donald Whiteside, and currently, or at that time, she didn't have custody of either of her children. I don't believe she's ever had custody of both of her children. According to the divorce attorney, Taylor had given up custody of her son when he was just four years old. And despite Tommy never requesting it or not even really wanting it, the judge who was overseeing their case at that time did rule that Taylor would have to pay child support, which of course Taylor never put a dime towards. Documents presented during the trial did show that Taylor owed $8,469 in child support and penalties as of January 2021. What's interesting to me here is that while Taylor was in jail, she threw a huge fit because Tommy had refused to allow her to see her son. Tommy claimed that Taylor could be incredibly cruel and that she would often lash out at her son if she didn't get where she wanted. So he obviously didn't want to allow communication between the two because he didn't want to expose his son to that. And when she wasn't allowed to see her son, she would get super upset and then would go on this whole rant about how much she loved her children, how it was so unfair that she was being forbidden to see her child. But Here's the thing, if she really loved her children that much, why did she give up custody of both of her children? And why, in all the years that she owed child support, did she never pay it? According to Wade, after Taylor had been arrested, he was cleaning up the house and he had found a number of envelopes that contained letters regarding the child support that she owed. And she had hidden all of these away, so she was clearly receiving these letters about her child support, but she didn't pay them. She was also hiding them from Wade because she didn't want him to know about it. So if she loved her children, she cared about her children that much, why would she hide the fact that she needed to pay child support and why didn't she just pay it? Also, I just want to clarify here that she only needed to pay like $200 worth of child support, which is way less than what she was actually supposed to be paying, but the judge just felt bad for it and agreed that she just needs to pay minimum wage. So if she had really wanted to pay child support, she would have found a way to do it. The divorce attorney also testified that Taylor had put a lot of pressure onto him and on Tommy to get the divorce finalized ASAP. And just 11 days after the divorce was finalized, Taylor would go on to marry her next partner, Hunter Parker. Tommy would also take the stand to make his own statement and he would testify to the court about his own experiences with Taylor as well as all the outrageous medical claims that she had made to him while they were together. There was one instance that really stuck out in his memory and this was a time where Taylor had gone in to visit the doctors and then she came out claiming that she had something wrong with her legs and wasn't really able to but then one day, when she thought no one was looking, Tommy caught her walking just fine, completely fine. But then when she noticed him standing there, she immediately went back to limping, pretending like she was injured. Taylor's new wife, Amy, also took the stand to speak about her own experiences with Taylor. According to both Tommy and Amy, Taylor had sent a number of letters to their son. These were all letters that she had written from her time in jail and their son just didn't want to read it. Their son's experience with Taylor was so traumatic that the poor boy doesn't even want to read the letters that his mom is writing him. Amy has decided to file away those letters for now. And when their son grows up to be a little bit older, Amy and Tommy will give him the chance to decide, will give him the choice to decide whether or not he wants to throw them away 
or if he wants to read what his mother has to say. Amy also spoke about her desire to co-parent with Taylor and to have that relationship with Taylor, but it proved to be impossible. Taylor, on numerous occasions, had missed her visitation appointments, had refused to pay child support, and there was one instance where a staff infection was involved. Taylor's son had apparently been spending some time at Taylor's house at, at one stage, and he was sleeping over for a few nights, maybe a week or something like that. And when Taylor returned her son to Amy and Tommy, they noticed that he had a staph infection. The reason for this is because Taylor had forgotten to change their son's underwear for five days, leading to this infection. And eventually, she was no longer allowed to have her son over for sleepovers because she was obviously not capable of taking care of her child. There were also instances where Taylor would have her son for visits and then to manipulate her son into saying or doing things that she wanted him to say, she'd just cry in front of him. She would also tell her son that it was okay to lie and that lying wasn't a bad thing to do. She's been so neglectful of her child that when she was in prison and she complained to her own mother about the fact that she wasn't able to see her son, Shauna actually calls her out on her BS. Shauna basically tells her that if you've been a better mother, that you wouldn't be in this situation. And because of your actions, you have to deal with the consequences, just like we are now dealing with the consequences of your actions. And this is a little bit surprising for me because Shauna is the hugest enabler in Taylor's life. She literally lets Taylor get away with anything and everything. I mean, she's letting her child basically get away with murder and defrauding a jailhouse, as well as ruining people's reputation and lives. So for her to call Taylor out for, for this, it's a huge deal. Next to the stands would be a former friend of Taylor's named Caitlin Glass. The two women had bonded after both women had been diagnosed with MS. However, throughout their two-year friendship, Caitlin testified that she began to notice something very off and very strange about Taylor. She began noticing a developing pattern. When Caitlin would fall ill with MS and had to be hospitalized, Taylor would rush over to visit her. And then just days later, Taylor would rush herself to the ER and claim that she was in so much pain due to her own MS. And this didn't just happen once or twice, it happened multiple times so many times that Caitlin was like, what? This is so weird. There's just something so off about this. And here's something with Taylor's MS. Whenever she went in claiming that she was in tons of pain, she would never be admitted into the hospital. The doctors would examine her and then send her home with some pain medication. And this wasn't the case for Caitlin. Caitlin, every time she became ill, she would be hospitalized. Like her MS was very serious. Again, she clearly always needed to be at the center of attention, and Caitlin was starting to pick up on this. Caitlin would also testify that she and Taylor were a part of the same chief group, and that she had seen Taylor cheating on Tommy, not once or twice, but multiple times as well. So eventually, Caitlin decided that she wanted absolutely nothing to do with this woman. This woman was conniving and a liar and just was not a good person. So she began to distance herself from Taylor. The jury would then hear from a woman by the name of Stephanie Hoff. Stephanie was also a former friend of Taylor's. Stephanie had actually hosted Taylor's gender reveal party and their friendship seemed to be going well until Taylor showed Stephanie her ultrasound photo. The ultrasound photo had the date 2016 printed on it. And when Stephanie asked about this, Taylor was very defensive. She would even tell Stephanie that the clinic had misprinted 324 incorrect gender reveals. Stephanie would also tell the court that Taylor had confided in her about being pregnant with twins. She also said that Taylor had told her that she had aborted the twins because she didn't believe Wade was ready to have children. But remember, Taylor had told Wade that she had lost the babies due to some freak accidents while towing farming equipment. Stephanie would then also recount an incident where she had straight up asked Taylor about the pregnancy 
in 2020. Stephanie was beginning to doubt that Taylor was really pregnant. And when she brought up her concerns to Taylor, this led to a huge fight between the two women. The fight got so bad at one point that Stephanie went to her kitchen, retrieved a kitchen knife and held it in her hand just in case because she was worried that Taylor might do something to her. When Taylor asked her what that knife was for, Stephanie would tell her, oh, I'm, I'm just going to use it to sharpen this pencil because she didn't really want to add more fuel to this confrontation. But she also wasn't sure if she needed to have this ready in case something went down. Moments later, the fight would be de-escalated and Stephanie would tell Taylor she needed to go by her daughter's school and to drop off a softball uniform for her daughter. And this is when Taylor tries to convince Stephanie not once or twice, but three times, to allow her to stay in Stephanie's home alone with Stephanie's four-year-old son. And of course, especially after the fight that they just had, Stephanie's not comfortable with this. She tells Taylor no, and she has to tell Taylor no three times before Taylor agrees to leave the house. And thank goodness for that decision because Taylor is clearly not a stable or reliable human, and we don't know what Taylor would have done to that four-year-old child if left alone with him. Wade's mother, Connie, would also take to the stand to provide her own statement. During her testimony, she would tell the jury that after Taylor had been arrested, Taylor had sent a number of letters to their home, not to her or to Wade, but to Jimmy, who is Wade's father. In the letter to Wade's father, Taylor would write, First off, I'm going to ask you to forgive me. Not that I deserve it, but I've asked God for forgiveness and I believe he has showed me. I believe his forgiveness should come first and that is something you taught me. Connie also shared that in the earlier stages of Taylor and Wade's relationship, Taylor would often bring her daughter to Connie's home. Instead of caring for her own child when she had the time with her child, she would leave her child with Connie. Taylor did this so often that Connie would have to remind Taylor that Connie wasn't this child's mother and that she also needed a break. Eventually, over the next few weeks, two of Taylor's former colleagues would be called to the stand. These were colleagues from Taylor's job in 2020 and they would speak at length about how Taylor had told them all these lies about her pregnancy, as well as lies about having cancer and having to miss work because family members died. There was even one instance where Taylor successfully convinced another colleague to pretend to be a bank representative and to speak on the phone with Wade to explain to him why there were delays with the money for Pecan Point. Again, if you've not watched part one of this case, please do so because I do explain the entire Pecan Point and missing money debacle that took place in 2020. Another of her former colleagues stated that Taylor was very, very, very scary when she was angry. When the company eventually decided to let Taylor go because of all the lying and the stories not adding up, the HR person who had to inform her of the termination actually got a little bit scared. Taylor apparently had the most hateful look on her face when the HR manager was telling her about this termination. And at one point, the HR manager was actually really concerned that Taylor was going to physically lash out at her. Next, a CEO of a company that Taylor had worked for in 2018 would come forward to testify that Taylor was let go during her probational period because she had gone to a pharmacist pretending to be a nurse so that she could get opioids. There was also another discovery made during the sentencing period that would send chills down the jury's spine. Taylor had worked at a different healthcare company after being let go in 2018, and on her resume, she would write that one of her greatest strengths was her experience and ability to comfort patients after they lost a child. This was obviously written before Taylor committed the crime in 2020, but many people, including myself, found it very disturbing to read considering the circumstances. On October 13, 2020, 
a forensic cytologist, Dr. Michael Arambula, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, would be called to the stand. While he did not interview Taylor, he did review all of the evidence and the records that were related to the crime. He was hoping to find some sort of clear evidence pointing to the fact that Taylor was mentally ill, just so that he could explain why Taylor had done what she did. But he would be surprised to discover that Taylor had no mental illnesses and had actually committed this crime with a clear head. He even, at one point, says the fact that Taylor was able to keep the schemes and lies going on for so long was impressive and extraordinary. I was looking for some kind of mental deterioration that would account for that, but instead, I saw that she stuck to her plan and there was no remorse afterwards, followed by the statements. In this case, there is nothing regarding any mental illness and nothing regarding intoxication. And Miss Parker falls in the category of fetal abductors, which are rare, but fall into a class of women who don't have a mental illness. The murders are planned. They're premeditated. They have plans for after. Now, let's talk about Taylor's most recent ex before we enter Parker. He would share information about how Taylor constantly lied to him about her medical issues just so that he wouldn't leave her. She really wanted to have a family with Hunter and was desperate for another baby, but she wasn't able to conceive another child. Also, she already has two children, so I'm not sure why she wanted a third child when she wasn't even taking care of the other two children that she had. But at one point, she becomes so desperate that she begins begging her friends to become surrogates for her. She offered them thousands of dollars to help her have a baby. Wild. And of course, those friends said no. And so those friends also testified saying they felt very uncomfortable around Taylor when they were pregnant because they just felt like something was really off. She would stare at their baby bump for way too long and just made uncomfortable remarks and it was weird. It was really weird for them. Now, obviously Taylor and Hunter's relationship would not work out. Taylor was just too manipulative, too much of a liar and just not a good person. Hunter couldn't deal with it anymore. So they went their separate ways. Now, I wanna quickly backtrack to that letter that Taylor had written for the FBI offering her assistance in solving murders. So it turns out she never sent that letter because it was actually found in her cell before she could do so. I'm reaching out to correspond with someone within the Federal Bureau to offer my services in exchange for my own help. For the last year, I've been mingling with many different types of criminals. She then proceeds to write that she's completely innocent of this crime and that she's hoping the FBI will allow her to work for them from within the jail so that she can avoid the death penalty. Part of this is for me and my future, what's left of it. The other half is my obligation to her, or maybe I'm just mad as a, because I'm going down for something I didn't do. I've accepted that, but being a part of it, seeing what unfolded and being unable to change the outcome, that's something I'll never get over because I can't understand it. This woman, oh my goodness. She includes in her letter that she's happy to work for them from the inside and that she's happy to play sexual mind games with both males and females within the jail. She writes that she basically runs this jail, that nobody messes with her. So she's the perfect person for this. She also then goes on to say that she's a very deep understanding of criminals and what goes on in their mind. I have a way of dissecting into a delicate balance the mind. Knowing it, connecting to it, and them makes me good at what I do. In a year, I've allowed myself time to help educate myself. Profiling what motivates a criminal. My favorite are the murders and their proxy. No words. No words at all. Did she really think that she was going to be able to manipulate the FBI? Was that her plan? I mean... I don't know. I have no idea, but is this woman for real? It is so crazy. She was gonna go 
and worked for the FBI, and then no doubt she was definitely going to try to manipulate the FBI. Wild. Back to the testimonies, we're going to talk about Dr. Stephen Hastings. Dr. Hastings was responsible for the baby's autopsy. And the information that he would share with the jury was just honestly devastating. During the autopsy that he did on the baby, he found that there were two fingernails embedded into the placenta. These fingernails were turned out to be Reagan's. And in Dr. Hastings' professional opinion, Reagan was alive when the baby was cut out from her. And Dr. Hastings' theory is that the fingernails were embedded into the placenta when the baby was being cut out and Reagan was holding on to the placenta, trying to protect her baby and to keep the baby from being extracted. The doctor would go on to testify that the baby had been alive when the baby was extracted, but in the end, the cause of death for the baby was due to a traumatic extraction. The extraction that Taylor had done had created a hemorrhage that would prove to be fatal to the baby. Reagan wasn't even dead when she was taking her baby from her. It's really, really disgusting and barbaric. So after this shocking discovery, it was time for Taylor's defense attorney to get to work. The first person that would be called to the stand for Taylor was her mother, Shauna. Shauna would talk about Taylor's childhood, and then she would also talk about her own divorce with Taylor's father. She would then also go into details about how Taylor had gotten a hysterectomy. Apparently the hysterectomy hadn't been planned. It was done because of another medical situation. They were in the process of sorting out another medical issue and that led to this hysterectomy. And while Taylor was under anesthesia, she could make this decision herself and the doctors needed a decision to be made. So the doctor then asked Shauna and Tommy what they wanted to do. And they made the decision to go ahead with the hysterectomy. After the surgery, Shauna claims that her own daughter had texted her and would ask her if she could have her mother's uterus. And Shauna was shocked by this. She was like, what? What in the world do you mean? And I guess Taylor just assumes that you could just transfer uteruses like it was nothing because she tries to tell her mother that hey it won't be so bad it'll be like a hysterectomy for you too and this way you won't ever need to deal with periods or cramping or any of those things anymore plus you're older so like why do you need your uterus like you're not gonna have more kids she said this to her mother so obviously her mother's like uh no i don't want to do that and that's not how that's not how it works honey but you know what's really wild to me? I'm sorry, I know I'm repeating the word wild like over and over again, but I just don't have any words to describe all the things that I'm learning from this case. Um, why is Shauna mentioning any of this? She's supposed to make these statements to show the court that her daughter is not insane, that her daughter is a good person. So why is she telling the jury that her daughter basically just tried to convince her to give up her own uterus. Now, I also have a feeling that Shauna does 100% believe everything that comes out of Taylor's mouth. She believes all the lies, she believes all of the mental illness claims as well as the physical illness claims because otherwise, what other reason would Shauna have to be so supportive of her daughter besides love? But she's the thing, you can love your child but know that your child is not a good person. But Shauna doesn't even seem to think that. Shauna is 100% supportive of her child and enables Taylor. And I think the reason for this is because she honestly believes that her daughter is not well. She literally even says to the court that if Taylor was a normal person, then none of this would have happened and no one would be in the situation that they're currently in insinuating that her daughter was ill and just wasn't able to control herself when the crime happened. Instead of just accepting the fact that her daughter is just a psychopath, she was capable of controlling herself. She she planned this murder out. She, she made a plan for this. It wasn't like she lost her temper in the heat of the moment and did what she did. No, she, this was 
premeditated. Also, another really shocking discovery from Shauna's testimony is the fact that Shauna knew her daughter was not pregnant. Shauna admitted to knowing that Taylor was lying about being pregnant. And not even that she knew after things went down. She knew during the time period that Taylor was pretending to be pregnant, that Taylor actually wasn't pregnant. She even says to the jury, not much you can do about fake pregnancy. She knew she wasn't pregnant. We knew she wasn't pregnant. There was no need to come up with a plan. We figured the lie would be exposed. He would figure it out. If she had come up with a baby, it would not have been hers. That's when the family would have done something. And from that statement, I now understand where Taylor's craziness comes from. This woman just admitted in front of everybody that she knew that her daughter was lying to her baby daddy and to her friends and to doctors and to basically everybody. And she was just gonna let it play out. She also admits that she would have only done something once Taylor had showed up with a, another baby. You would only do something after your daughter steals another child. Like you, you, you're gonna wait for that to happen before you teach your child wrong from right. Now, the second person to take the stand is Taylor's brother, Zachary. And Zachary is a, seems to be a lot more sensible than his mother and his father. He was incredibly apologetic to Reagan's family. And he was the only person in the family to show any sort of remorse for what his sister had done. He testified that while he knew that Taylor was fake pregnant, he had given her a deadline to come clean to Wade and to everybody else before he would do it himself. Zachary was apparently the only person in his family to have confronted Taylor. Nobody else in the family gave him any support on this. Zachary would then close off his statement by telling the jury that he would accept whatever decision they came to for his sister and that he absolutely does not make any excuses for what she's done. And after Zachary's statement, the defense team would then call up their own experts to talk about Taylor's state of mind. A Dr. Edward Gripen, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, would testify that Taylor showed symptoms of someone with narcissism and personality disorder. Dr. Gripen is an expert in future dangers, so I assume his job is to predict whether or not an individual is going to be a future danger to society or to themselves. He did say that he wouldn't be able to predict whether or not Taylor would continue to be a danger to society, but that she would definitely continue to be manipulative and to lie. However, he then also follows up with that by saying that this incident, this murder, was an isolated incident and that she's never had any other history of violence. I just want to clarify here that the whole point of this sentencing period is to determine whether or not Taylor should spend the rest of her life in jail or if she should receive the death penalty. So her defense team already knew that she was never going to walk free, that she was either going to spend her life in prison or be sentenced to death. And their goal here was to make sure that she wasn't sentenced to death and that she instead just spends the rest of her life in jail. With these experts that they called in, they were hoping to try to paint her as a mentally ill person who couldn't control her actions. The second expert that they would call in was a neurologist who stated that he believed Taylor had a severe lobe dysfunction. And because of this severe lobe dysfunction, it apparently impacts her ability to control her impulses. In short, he's saying that because of this disorder or this dysfunction, she was unable to control herself. She couldn't help what she did. He even tried to show MRIs and CAT scans to prove this, but the prosecutors did fire back with normal brain scans taken by all of Taylor's previous doctors. The neurologist would then go on to say that maybe those doctors had missed this in their scans because they weren't looking for it when they initially did the scans. I'm no doctor, so I don't know how it works, but if you do and you're a doctor and you're watching this, please tell us how that works, actually. So the court does bring forth two medical experts who end up confirming that the information provided by the defense team's experts were just inaccurate. And during the closing arguments, Reagan's mother, Jessica, would take the stand. 
She would speak about the difficulties that her family was going through now because of Taylor's actions. She told the court that not only is she dealing with the loss of a child, but she's now become distanced with family members that she used to be close with because it's just been too difficult. She would even talk about how traumatizing this entire thing has been for Reagan's three-year-old daughter, who had to witness her mother being murdered. This poor child has been left with so much trauma that when she sees pregnant women, she just stares at the belly. And Jessica says that she does this because she wants to make sure that they're not bleeding. And sometimes she'll even go up to the women and ask if she can see their bellies because she wants to make sure that the baby is actually in there. Final closing arguments end with a photo showing Reagan's lifeless body at the crime scene. This photo was a shock to the jury as they caught a glimpse of what Jessica and her three-year-old granddaughter witnessed on October 9th, 2020. On Wednesday, November 9th, 2022, the jury was sent to deliver it, and they would do so in just 90 minutes. When the jury came back, they would read the verdict to Taylor, and Taylor would learn that she was to be sentenced to the death penalty. And in addition to that sentencing, she was also required to sit through the victim impact speeches. And as she was being handcuffed and moved to the stand to go and listen to these speeches, she would begin crying and shaking and looking completely devastated. And I think this is the first time anyone's really seen much emotion from her. But you know what? The emotion that she's showing, I don't think it's for Reagan or for what she did. It's for the fact that she, for once in her life, she's not getting what she wants. Taylor would be removed from the courtroom immediately after the trial wrapped up and she would be moved to death row. She would be transported to Mountain View Unit where she currently sits alongside six other women on death row. And I don't think she fully understands what she's really in for at this new unit because it's definitely not gonna be as lax as her previous one. Gone are the days of mingling with inmates and having jailhouse relationships and schemes. She won't be able to work because that's now a privilege. And she won't be able to leave her cell for anything but showers and two hours per day of recreational time. She's going to be carefully supervised and put on incredibly strict routines. So strict that she won't even be able to eat her lunch or dinners outside of her cell. And apparently the only way that she'd be allowed to work is if she can somehow prove to the warden that she's trustworthy and respectable. We all know Taylor and how difficult it's going to be for her to not lie, to not scheme, to not be manipulative. So I think it's going to be a really hard time for her. After the verdict had been read out to the room, the prosecutors and Reagan's family can be seen embracing. And while this verdict won't be able to bring Reagan back, it's still a huge success for their family. Reagan and her baby got the justice they deserved. The person responsible for this heinous crime and for taking away their lives will never be able to do harm to anyone else ever again. And I know that the death penalty is a really touchy subject for a lot of people, but in my opinion, I think I think the jury made the right decision. What Taylor did is just beyond words, and she definitely doesn't deserve a second chance. People like her won't change. They don't want to change. And she would have just ended up doing something just as horrible to someone else if justice wasn't served. That does bring this case to a close, guys. I know it's been an incredibly long case, so I really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch and to support me. And if you didn't watch the entire video or both videos, then that's also fine. I just want to say thank you as well for your time and for tuning in and watching until you did. And I really appreciate you guys. Again, as always, if you have any case recommendations or any specific cases that you'd like for me to just look into, please be sure to drop an email to truecrimemagentai at gmail.com. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a wonderful week ahead. Bye guys.